Good morning, everybody. Wonderful to see you. I'm glad that you're here. It's good to be together on Sundays. Don't you think so? I think so. So here we are now in John's Gospel, chapter 1, beginning with verse 35, and we're going to read down to the end of verse number 42. Let's begin reading. It'll be on the screens for you as well. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. Now, remember, this is John the Baptist. So John the Apostle or disciple is writing this, and then John the Baptist, he's the one who is introducing Jesus to the people of Israel. So the next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him saying this, they followed Jesus. Now, I'll say more about this in a moment or in, during a message. One was Andrew, which he's directly introduced in the text, and the other one was most likely John, who did not speak of himself directly in the gospel in order to be modest about his identity, not to brag about who he was. So anyway, when the two disciples heard him saying this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them follow and asked, what do you want? Now, uh, that, that sounds kind of blunt, you know, like, well, why are you stalking me? <laughs> Maybe it, it, it better translate it, what are you looking for, or what can I do to help you? So what do you want? What can I do to help you? What are you looking for? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Now, John was writing to non-Jews who did not know either Hebrew, which was the language of the Old Testament, or the language that they spoke in Jesus' day related to Hebrew called Aramaic. So every time that John uses an Aramaic or Hebrew word, he always explains it to those who are reading so they can understand. So they said, Rabbi, which is a, a Hebrew word for teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which is the Aramaic word, which when translated is Peter. When it's time to believe in Jesus, believe in Jesus. Now John the Baptist comes and he preaches. He's tremendously attractive. His preaching is very, very powerful. And he draws many thousands of people to him in his ministry. They, many of them bat, are, repent and are baptized in the Jordan River. In that great crowd of people, there were two people we meet here, Andrew and the man John. Now they were hearing the preaching of, of John the Baptist, and they were saying to themselves, we want to meet this man that John is talking about. John was introducing this guy who would be the Messiah. And as he preached about him, Andrew and John said, we've got to have this guy that John is talking about. And I want to just give you an example of John's preaching. Now, I know that I'm not as attractive as John, nor is my voice as powerful as John, but I want you to, to pay attention to this, just like John himself was here preaching and not little learning. Verse 29, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and, and he said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I met when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him, and I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testified that this is God's chosen one. So Andrew and John heard this powerful preaching, and they said, we want the man that John is preaching about. Then one day... John is uh, by the side of the road. Maybe he was sitting in his easy chair. I don't know. And Jesus walks by. And Andrew and the disciple John are listening. And John the Baptist says, There he is, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So John identified him. And right then, now, you know, Andrew and John, they loved John the Baptist. They enjoyed his preaching. They enjoyed following him. But at that moment, they left John... And he started following Jesus. 
You see, they had heard the story about Jesus, and when it came time to believe and follow Jesus, they followed Jesus. Now, across the years, I have worked with all kinds of people. It's been a blessing for me. And I have known people who have who've talked to me about their spiritual hunger. They're looking for something. They, they have problems in their lives, and, and I gently point out to them that the problems that they have are because of their sin. I urge them to believe in the gospel and to receive Jesus as Savior so they can have a supernatural power to overcome their sin. And as I talk to them about this, people say back to me, you know, Pastor Ernie or Ernie, I, uh, I know about Jesus. I, I'm thinking about Jesus, but it's not the right time for me. It, it, it's sometime in the future. I'll keep thinking about it. And they, they, they work on it themselves. They turn over a new leaf. They try themselves to get their lives straight. And they're just not able to do it, but they keep on working inside themselves to do what only God can do. And for some reason, they put off believing in Jesus. And unfortunately and sadly, I have known people who have done this for years, even decades, and who die without ever coming to that place of believing. They know to believe, and yet they do not believe. John tells Andrew and John, the beloved disciple, about Jesus. And they hear, and at that moment, they believe. This is important. It's important. When it's time to believe in Jesus, you don't put it off. Stop procrastinating. What's going to give you the excuse to believe? Well, you put it off, it's not going to happen. You know, um, I've always loved cars. Every year I go to the car show at the Virginia Beach Pavilion. I, I mark my year by Christmas and the car show. <laughs> So when the car show comes by in January, I say, another year has gone by. And um, years ago, by the way, I, I finally had my dream car. I love my car. I'm in my 50s now, and I got my dream car. I love it. It's, a, it's not a Corvette. It's a Volkswagen, but I still love my car. But when I was 30 years old, Honda came out with a little car called a CRX. It was a very small car, probably weighed about 1,900 pounds. But it was very sporty, it was very quick, it handled very well, and boy, did I want one. Now, there's a, a Volkswagen dealership on J. Clyde Morris Boulevard in Newport News, if you know anything about Newport News, not too far from Casey Chevrolet. And they had one in front of, on, a, on a ramp, and I would go by almost every day and look at it. I'd look inside of it, I'd sit inside of it, and I really had a hunger, I really wanted it. The salesman comes up to me and says, you know, you just put $100 down and hold it. And I did it. <laughs> I put $100 down and I held it. I know this is all sales technique. You know, I know that it is. But the next day he calls me. He says, Ernie, you made your decision yet? I said, well, you know, I, I don't think I can afford it. He goes, listen, buddy, I got seven people who want this thing. And this is the first time I ever heard this in my life, what he said to me. He said, you snooze, you lose. So I bought the car. I drove it for eight years, and I loved it until the time I sold it. It was a wonderful car. And, and you know, so here, 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 I was looking at this car. I was thinking about this car. I had a hunger for this car. And by the way, I believe people have a hunger for God, a hunger for Jesus. And I, one of my favorite verses in all the Old Testament is found in Jeremiah 29. If, if you want me, you can have me if you seek me with all your heart. And I believe people are seeking Jesus and what is wonderful about this, if you seek him, you will find him, yes. And John says, there he is. You found him. John says, there he is. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. There he is. And so when it comes time to believe in Jesus, at that moment you believe in him. Maybe the day is a day. You're here in this place. You're at the West Portsmouth campus. You're watching online, and you are thinking about it. You're hungering for it, but you have been waiting. You've paused. You haven't done it. When you have a chance to believe in Jesus, believe in Jesus. Now, we have a definition here of what it means to believe in the Lord Jesus. And I, and I want you to listen. Following is believing. Following is believing. It's not an intellectual thing primarily. 
Now, there is an intellectual part of this. You, know, you have to know the gospel, hear the gospel. There, there are things about Jesus that you need to hear about, it, that his, how he's a savior, how he died for you. There's all kinds of things to learn about Jesus in Scripture. The intellectual part of it is important. Now, C.S. Lewis, the great philosopher and writer, he was a very intelligent man, and there was a strong intellectual component to his belief. But if you read his spiritual biography, you will discover that it wasn't just what he knew intellectually. He had a, a spiritual struggle going on. It went on for 15 years before he came to that place of believing. So it's not just intellectual. Andrew and John have been hearing about the one who was going to come. And John had pointed him out. There he is, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And they left John that day, and they began to do what believing really is. They started following Jesus, because following is believing. It wasn't just what they knew. They were making a commitment of their life by following. And so here they are, they're looking at Jesus, they're falling all behind him. I don't know whether they were embarrassed or ashamed or afraid to bother him. Jesus turns around and looks at them and says, what do you want? Now, I don't think he was saying, are you a bunch of stalkers? <laughs> What's going on here? I think he was saying, what are you looking for? What are you after? What are you trying to find in me? And Andrew and John says, listen, we want to learn who you are. Can we come and stay with you? Now, in the first century, staying with somebody was a big deal. It meant you were sharing life. You know, if somebody comes to visit us from out of town, oftentimes they stay in the, in the Holiday Inn. They don't stay with us at our house. But in the first century, that wasn't the case. When you came to visit town, you always stayed with someone who you knew, and that was a sharing of life. So Jesus was saying, you come and stay with me. I will, I will share my life with you. And he began, the moment that they made that commitment to stay with him, he began to share with them the gospel and what the gospel was all about. And on that day, these two men went from being followers of John the Baptist to being followers of Jesus because believing really is following. And so if you want to be a believer in Jesus, what it means is you become a follower of Jesus. Whatever he teaches, you will listen to and you will learn. Wherever he takes you, you will go. Whatever he asks of you or commands of you, you will follow that command and you will do what he says. You will follow him even to bearing your own cross. It is your own ministry, your own burden, your own life before God. You will go wherever he goes because being a believer is really being a follower. Now, I was... Uh, when I was in college, InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, small group leader, and um, I was assigned a, a girl named Debbie Farabee to my, to my group. And so I called on the phone to tell her when the group was meeting and asked her to come and be part of the, of the group. And she said, well, you know, listen, I'm really involved in the Baptist Student Union. I'm vice president this year. She eventually became president the next year. And uh, she said, I really can't become part of the small group. And, and you know, I said, okay. And then I discovered as I was talking to her, I was on staff at a church as, as youth director, and she was going to the same church where I was on staff. It was a very, very large church, and she was involved in another, another ministry there, so I, did, I never saw her. Unfortunately, it was a large church then, and like it often is the case, it's now a very small church, and that kind of thing just, just makes me so sad. But anyway, a few weeks later, I was in the lunchroom, just bought a cheeseburger, back when I could eat cheeseburgers, you know. I have one a week now. And uh, someone said, hey, that, that, that girl, Debbie Fairby, you talked to on the phone, there she is. And I turned and looked at her. She was wearing a long yellow canvas coat and a burgundy brocaded, or excuse me, um, I, I, my, my needle point and hand things get me mixed up sometimes, crocheted cap. And I, I, I believe in love at first sight. And I was hit by a hammer at that moment, and I was instantly in love. There, there's a movie called Somewhere in Time, which came out in 1980, which I realize for most of us is three or four lifetimes ago. <laughs> but it's a great, great movie. And Christopher Reeves, Superman, you know, he he's, goes to a hotel, and it's a, it's a very involved story, but he's in the museum, 
and he, of the hotel. He turns and looks. There's a picture on the wall of Jane Seymour, the actress. And he looks at the picture. And Jane Seymour and Debbie could be sisters. They look that much alike. And he looks at the picture and he falls in love like that. I relate to that. I went up and talked to her, and the moment I started talking to her, I was ready to get the ring, have, have, schedule the wedding, get us on the Bible registry at Nackman's, uh, buy a house with a picket fence, get a dog, and have kids. That's what I was ready for right that moment. Now, it took her about six months. <laughs> but I was ready at that particular moment. And what happened was, that I just follow her around like a little puppy dog, you know, mooning at her, you know, Googling eyes at her. And, and um, she was probably wondering, what's this guy doing? Why is he always doing this? So I was at the Baptist Student Union one day, and I was laying on the sofa, which I did a lot of in college, laying on the sofa in the Baptist Student Union. And she came up suddenly on the edge of the sofa, and she leaned over and says, why don't you take me out Sunday night after church? Now, that she, this actually happened, but she denies it to this very day. And if you talked to her out of the foyer on the lay, you mentioned it to her, she'd say, that didn't happen. Well, okay, two different recollections of the same event. But we went out after church on Sunday, and man, I tell you, I was, I was even deeper, more deeply in love then than I was when I first saw her. And, you know, this is how it is. You, 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 you see something that you like. You see something you fall in love with. You're afraid to make the commitment. You're afraid to act. I was a stutterer, and I had a hard time talking to girls. And I, I, was try I couldn't talk to her, and I was afraid. But then she called me. <laughs> Are you following this? You've been hearing about Jesus for years. You've been wondering about him. Wanting, you have a hunger in your heart, and you want to believe in him. But for some reason, you always put it off. But the one that you want to believe in is calling you. Come and believe in me. Come follow me. Come learn from me. And you'll grow and mature in Jesus. And you'll become a different person. Now, we're just following the story here. Followers become leaders. So believing is following, and followers become leaders. And I wanted to find a leader there. I don't mean necessarily leading a ministry or becoming a pastor or some kind of uh, Christian leader. I'm not talking about that kind of leading. But here's what happened with Andrew. Andrew had been thinking about Jesus, looking for him, hungering for him. He meets him. He spends the day with him, and he becomes absolutely convinced that John's testimony about Jesus is true, that this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jo Listen, Andrew gets saved. He gets saved. Now, he loves his brother. Brothers are close. He th says to himself, the f i got to go tell my brother. He's got to have this. Now, we don't know a lot about Cephas before he meets Jesus. But he was, he was called the rock. And I think he was called the rock as a joke. Have you ever known a short person you call Stretch? I was, in, you know, I was involved in baseball. We have people we would do that with. And, or a big guy we would call Tiny. Yeah, I was oftentimes called good looking. That was what they called, called me. But we, 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 you, what you do is you call somebody something which is opposite what they are. It's kind of like a little joke, you know, and it's kind of like between friends. And so they, they might have been calling him the rock because he was angry. He was always on the edge. He would speak his peace. He would say what he wanted to say. He'd make all kinds of commitments. And you can see this in the Gospels, can't you? But when it came push to shove, when it came to put the money down, he'd always pull back. And so he was like a rock made out of marshmallow. And Jesus says, okay, everybody's calling you rock, ha, ha, ha. I'm going to call you Cephas, which in Aramaic is rock, translated Peter in the Greek. I'm going to call you rock because people are making fun of you, but I'm going to make you into a rock. You're going to believe in me, Peter, and it's going to change who you are, and you're going to become one of the leaders of the church. So I want you to see how this is, this is working. Andrew, a follower becomes 
someone who leads. And what he leads is his brother and other people to Jesus. All through the Gospels, you find Andrew. when He was kind of like a second-tier disciple. He wasn't part of the inner circle. But whenever you see him, he's always taking somebody to Jesus. He took his brother, and his brother had the transformation that God can give you to make you into a leader to help reach people. I don't know what it is about believers in the 21st century. I don't know what it is. Maybe we have become afraid of the world because the world is so hostile to us. Maybe we're afraid of what our friends think. Maybe we don't want to put out the price that's required of a, of a, of a real leader inside the, the, the work of Jesus. But we are afraid to talk about him. We are afraid to speak about him. We are afraid to invite people to our church. Now, you know, you don't have to know the deep things of theology. You should know Scripture, and you should grow in your understanding. You should be able to explain how to become a Christian. I want to encourage you to do that, but you don't have to. All you have to do is say the same kind of thing that Andrew said to Peter. Come and see. Come and see what he's like. And if you bring people to your church... People will come and they'll believe and be saved. You bring people. You do this. Don't be afraid to be a leader. You know, I, was, I have talked about this on several occasions, and I like to have, I like to get, every once in a while someone says, what you said was true. I like, hear, I like, I like hearing that. <laughs> Never mind. You preached a sermon earlier, and it, it really, you know, I liked it. It really, it was true. Uh, you know, I talked about saying to people, God bless you. Do you remember me saying this? I would... Okay, so what I've done is, uh, at the very minimum, when I meet somebody, I'll tell them when I say, say goodbye, I say, God bless you. I'm out walking in my neighborhood, exercising, I say, God bless you, you know. And so um, one day I'm going to die, and they're going to say, that was the God bless you guy, you know, that's what they're going to say about me. But he, talk, he said, Ernie, I've started saying God bless you to people, and it's transformed relationships. People talk to me now. He said, I haven't had a single person say to me, shut up, don't bother me with that. Isn't it amazing? Just the power of saying, God bless you. Well, was a, that's the very smallest minimum of what I'm talking about. And I'm telling you because I'm kind of shocked that something I said actually got through. <laughs> Never mind. So in other words, you, you, you start using your relationships and start leading people. You can very minimally you can say, come and be a part of my church. And hear what the gospel is all about. Now, a few years ago, I went to buy a CD at Barnes & Noble at Town Center. Do you remember CDs? Remember those? Okay. You know, vinyl's coming back, records coming back, and now CDs are coming back. Isn't that amazing? So, you know, I'm a classical music guy. I know it kind of marks me as being weird, but uh, I have a, a nice uh, system with a tube amplifier and, and headphones. I, I, so I listen, and I have a good time. So I went to buy a CD, and when I got to, to Barnes & Noble at Town Center, there was a tour bus there, and the parking lot was packed with what appeared to be maybe thousands of people. And there were cars parked everywhere and people in line around the block. And so I walked up to some, some guy. I was standing there. I said, hey, uh, what's going on? He said, well, Insane Clown Posse are here, and they are signing their latest album. Now, maybe because I'm a classical music fan, I never heard of Insane Clown Posse before. Have you heard of them, David? Have you heard of them? Okay. <laughs> so... <laughs> So I went back and looked them up on Wikipedia, and I want to let you know that they had the right name. <laughs> the name fits them perfectly. <laughs> and so I started reading about them, you know, on Wikipedia, and they have kind of a relationship with wrestling, and some of the wrestlers appear in their shows, and they do kind of a mixture of, of hip-hop and, uh, and rap, and they have a, a, they're part of what's called the horror genre, and I also found out, very strangely, that deep inside of, of their singing is embedded a Christian message. And, and I read about what their, what their own personal faith is. I thought, well, these two things don't really go together. But I was reading about it. And they have followers who number several million called the Juggalos. And in St. Count Posse, they don't do any advertising. They don't publish anything in magazines. When they come to a town for a concert, they don't have any publicity for the concert. They don't publicize their album. The Juggalos do all the work of spreading the word. I hope you're getting the parallel here, okay? Insane Clown Posse is a lot different 
I think, from what we do here on Sunday morning. <laughs> but yet they have been able to build this massive following of millions of people through people just saying to their friends, won't you come and see and listen? And that's the power of followers becoming leaders. So, when it's time to believe in Jesus, believe in Jesus. And what that means is you won't just have an intellectual knowledge and start following Him and learning from Him how to live. And then as you become a follower of Jesus, that will naturally lead into you becoming a leader who leads people around you, your family, your friends, to come have the same faith that you have. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I'm praying right now that people who are listening in this place now, over in West Portsmouth, who are watching online by the hundreds, I pray that they'll come to a place right now of hearing about Jesus, being attracted to Him and His message, and say it's time to believe, and they'll believe right now. And as they believe, they'll come to a place out of their hunger where they start following Jesus and learning from Him. And may that following result in them becoming a leader inside of your people to lead other people around them to follow Jesus too. Now, if you're that person that we're talking about, you know about Jesus, you're listening to his message, and maybe this has gone on for years, but you haven't believed. I pray you'll be like Andrew and John. When they had the chance to follow the one that John the Baptist talked about, they followed in one moment. Will you follow in one moment? Pray this prayer with me. Pray it from the bottom of your heart. Heavenly Father, I know that I'm a sinner. I've broken your laws and commands. And I pray you'll forgive me based on what Jesus Christ has done for me on the cross. I pray you'll come and live inside me by the power of His Spirit that I might know that I'm saved and have a real relationship with you. In Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer and you meant that prayer, you're now part of God's family. And we want to know so we can share more with you how you can grow as a believer how we can schedule your baptism so you can become part of God's family. Let, let us know with the card you find in the chair, the form attached to the worship program at both campuses. You can take that form and drop it in the offering box or take it by the Welcome Center. We'll stay in touch with you. If you're watching online, we have a counselor there who will be willing to talk with you and help you through your decision. And every week, people are talking to counselors about making a decision, and you can be one of those people too. Heavenly Father, we pray. As we leave this place, we'll leave as a follower of Jesus. And as a follower, next week, we'll lead somebody back with us to hear about the gospel. That's our prayer we make now, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, everyone. Thanks for watching. Be sure to drop us a like, subscribe, and follow us on social media so you don't miss any future DC Church content.